Thank you for watching this talk. I want to introduce uh, Todd, who, with whom I've had the pleasure to dive in uh, Costa Rica and uh, at Google Silent. Got to learn way too many things. Actually, it's not too many. I've all the work that he's done as well as his colleagues uh, to help the sea life. And I don't want to be giving a talk for him, so I'll just uh, let you talk, Todd. All right, thanks. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Mark, for inviting me here to Google. So my name is Todd Steiner, and I'm the executive director of Turtle Island Restoration Network. We're a nonprofit environmental group based here in the Bay Area uh, with offices around the world. Um, we work on marine species that are endangered, and currently our major areas of uh, action are salmon. We have a project called the Salmon Protection and Watershed Network, uh, which works locally here to protect the critically endangered coho salmon of the Bay Area. Won't be talking much about that today. And then we have a program um, that concentrates on protecting sharks and a program that works on protecting sea turtles. The title of my talk today is Protecting Sharks and Turtles at Cocos Island National Park with Drones, Satellites, Submarines, and You. The outline of my talk today, I'm going to try to cover four issues um, in this brief time. One is give you a little introduction to Turtle Island Restoration Network, our history, where we've been and where we're going. Then I want to convince you that Cocos Island is in fact the most beautiful island in the world um, and one of the most incredible places underwater on the planet. Then I'll talk about our work at Cocos Island briefly and then I will end by letting you know how you all can get involved and, and help us move forward. So Turtle Island Restoration Network started out actually called the Sea Turtle Restoration Project and we began working um, on a Aribata beach, a beach where one species of sea turtles, Olive Ridley sea turtles, massed in this net, in this um, mass nesting behavior where Literally tens of thousands of turtles come up simultaneously to lay their eggs. It's an, one of the amazing events in nature and one that I recommend that you get yourself to one of these beaches to see sometime. There are only 12 beaches around the world where this occurs and we're working to protect these important beaches around the world. We use sea turtles and in fact endangered species to do our work, one because they provide us with a legal tool to get changes made, too, because they're incredibly fascinating animals that people want to protect. And three, what we're doing to the sea turtles is what we're doing to the ocean. So we really see them as a vehicle to shifting the paradigm of how we treat the oceans. So back in 1987, I went to one of these Aribata beaches in Nicaragua. Um, this was during the Sandinista period. Um, there was a war going on, the Contra War, um, and I found these biologists living under a tarp um, trying to work to protect these turtles. Um, this was pretty much before the internet. They were totally isolated because they were, the U.S. Uh, was supporting the Contras, uh, trying to overturn the Sandinista government. They were really isolated. So I went there, found out what was going on, and decided that I needed to help. This is what I looked like back then. Um, I'm a herpetologist by training, so i interested in sea turtles and snakes there in my hand. And uh, people joke that I'm still wearing the same watch. So we um, started out very grassroots. This was really, um, I was doing this on my own time at Back then, um, I was working at another environmental organization and uh, I actually started selling beer and sodas to the other people to raise money to start this project. That's how grassroots it was. So literally, the cost of a biologist at the time in Nicaragua was about $30 a month. So by basically just selling soft drinks to the other employees, I could raise enough money to hire several additional biologists to work down on the beach we got them some resources. We bought them a tent. So we went from a tarp to a tent, um, and we were making progress. 
before we were done there, and we're still not done there, we had actually built a biological field station. Um, and now that biological field station protects this nesting beach. It's now a national wildlife refuge, and it's one of the most important beaches in the world uh, for all of Ridley sea turtles. While we were there, so up in the left-hand corner, you can see uh, the flipper uh, of a sea turtle and a little marker that we place on them, a permanent marker. Um, so we started tagging these turtles. That was the technology of the time of how you figured out where these turtles were going. You put a tag on their flipper. If someone caught them or saw them later, they would send the information to us. There's a little reward, a number on the flipper, on the tag, and then on the other side it says a reward and there's an address. So these animals that we were tagging started showing up in southern Mexico in the state of Oaxaca, and we learned that there was a slaughterhouse where they were killing 50 to 75,000 turtles a year. So on my vacation time with my wife in tow and my one-year-old son in his backpack carrier, we went to uh, Mexico and started looking for the slaughterhouse. And lo and behold, we found it. Um, we snuck into the slaughterhouse with my son on the back pretending we were tourists. We videotaped it. We came back and we started an international campaign to close the slaughterhouse. That was the largest killing of an endangered species that was occurring anywhere in the world at the time. Um, and with these images that we brought back and with a relatively unsophisticated campaign, um, we embarrass Mexico into closing the slaughterhouse. In fact, by 1990, Mexico had closed the slaughterhouse. They had made the harvesting of sea turtles in Mexico illegal, and they had joined the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, um, the treaty that protects endangered species. And we did that by running these full-page ads. There's a picture of one um, in the New York Times, basically putting forth the facade that we were a big group and we were going to cause them trouble, where in reality we were a handful of people who scraped together enough money to run a full page ad. We hung banners off of uh, buildings across the street from consulates and embassies around the country, and it worked. We also understood that the people who were killing those sea turtles were poor, and we needed to find an alternative because passing laws is one thing, getting laws enforced is another. So we worked with the government of Mexico to um, create an alternative for the people there. And my idea was to turn the slaughterhouse into a museum, into a sea turtle museum, similar to the whale museums we have in this country. So that was part of our history. We don't do it anymore because we know better and because the animals are endangered. And so the same idea was to create a museum um, that would provide employment to the local community as an alternative to harvesting sea turtles. So I can happily report today there is a sea turtle museum at the site of the slaughterhouse. We then turned our attention to Japan, which was still importing sea turtle products from around the world, and we used the same techniques. We ran a full page ad, we hung banners off the of buildings, we protested out in front of consulates and embassies, and lo and behold, Japan dropped their reservation in CITES and stopped the import of sea turtles. Now we're working on bluefin tuna, tuna which uh, Japan is importing um, in unsustainable ways. So along the way, we created a conservation toolbox. And we use these tools to get better policies to protect the ocean around the world. We base everything we do on the best available science. If the science doesn't exist, we go out and do the science ourselves. Um, we do grassroots organizings, public media campaigns, these full page ads. Uh, we'll take legal action when necessary. And we will get people involved, people like you. And we really need people like you to succeed um, because despite our 26 year history, we're still a handful of people uh, working out of an office or several offices trying to save the oceans. And so um, it's been fun. And I would say that uh, we actually, uh, uh oh, just broke the microphone.
that we um, excuse me there we go we were actually one of the first groups to have a website so we were actually able to get seaturtles.org way back when and at the time this was dial-up modem time things were incredibly slow and someone I was talking to started telling me about websites and I didn't know what they were and he convinced me that it was going to be the cutting edge and lo and behold created a website for us which was database driven which was way before WordPress days so that because we, we couldn't afford to have a webmaster um, created a website for us and and that's how we operate we get people who are on the cutting edge of technology people who are incredibly creative to help us save the oceans and we can't do it without those people um, as you'll see I'm highly not technological myself um, in case there are any questions here about the technology I'm about to show you so we ended the largest slaughter of an endangered species anywhere in the world we then turned our attention to the next biggest impact on sea turtles and that was fishing and the worst fishery for sea turtles is shrimp trawling and possibly the worst fishery in the world for the oceans is shrimp trawling so a shrimp trawl is a giant uh, net that's dragged along the bottom scrapes up everything in its path it's dumped onto the deck of a boat they pick out the shrimp and then they throw everything else overboard uh, usually dead and that includes sea turtles but it includes five to ten pounds of animals that are destroyed for every pound of shrimp harvested so we did what we always did we ran full page ads we took legal action we put political pressure on the US government um, to get turtle excluder devices, a trap door that allows sea turtles to escape in the nets and also reduces bycatch. And once we got some rules in place in the United States, we turned our attention to the rest of the world and we actually got a law passed that said nations who want to import shrimp into the US have to use comparable technology to protect sea turtles. And so we then went to other countries around the world and tried to convince them provided them training on how to use these turtle excluder devices and some of them did and some of them didn't so we went to court and we um, got this law enforced that requires TEDs on all vessels who, who catch shrimp and want to sell it in the US um, we also worked on getting marine protected areas which again at the time was a new concept um, luckily it is now taking off but we worked very hard to get uh, Kemp's Ridley swimway created in Texas where the turtles nest um, these are Kemp's Ridley sea turtles as opposed to the olive Ridley I mentioned earlier um, and probably the most endangered sea turtle in the world so again using the same techniques we'd used before we pressured then um, then Governor Bush running for president to put in place a, a marine protected area because his environmental record as he was running for president was uh, questioned by us um, the use of turtle excluder devices around the world led to a conflict at the World Trade Organization where countries said it was unfair for us to make them use these turtle excluder devices if they wanted to sell their shrimp in the US um, ultimately we won that case there is a, an environmental provision for for trade restrictions based on the on the environment um, we did that by helping to organize thousands of people in the street at the Battle of Seattle in 1999 um, so we had 200 people dressed as sea turtles um, we ended up being the centerfold of Newsweek magazine uh, the New York Times called us the symbol of peaceful protest at the WTO meetings and uh, a good time was had by all we then after getting some relatively good pieces in place to protect sea turtles from shrimp fishing we turned our attention to long line fishing 
and this is a method that places a 60 mile long line in the ocean and then dangles thousands of baited hooks off of that. In Worldwide, more than 2 billion hooks are being placed in the ocean every year, more than 5 million hooks a day. And unfortunately, way more than the target species, swordfish and tuna, are caught on those hooks. And so we turned our attention to trying to reform the longline fishery. And again, using the techniques that I mentioned before that we continue to refine, we made some major progress. So in California, we closed the, the uh, high seas longline fishery forever. And in Hawaii, um, we got major restrictions in place. We closed the fishery for four years while they worked on new technology to improve the fishery. Um, today, if they catch more than a handful of sea turtles, they must close for the rest of the year. Um, and so we continue to monitor that fishery. We continue to um, make progress on modifying the behavior of the fishermen to catch less endangered species. We then again focused our attention internationally. Again, first we need to get clean our own house before we tell other countries what they should be doing, and that's what we did. We then turned around, we went to the United Nations, we called for a moratorium on longline fishing while better methodologies were put in place for the rest of the fleet around the world. More than a thousand scientists from 97 nations signed on to our full page ad more than 281 NGOs. And the result is that there have been modifications to longline fishing around the world um, as a result of this campaign. We also want to get individuals involved. And so to reduce the demand for swordfish, which, by the way, is one of the highest fish in mercury, and the EPA and FDA warn women and children not to eat it at all, and everybody else to minimize the amount that they eat. Um, we used a law in California called Prop 65, the right to know law. And again, filing litigation, we got all supermarkets in California to post the warning that you see here on the left. So if you go into the supermarket, you should see these warnings everywhere. Um, that was the result of litigation that we did. We set up a website called gotmercury.org, where you can go there, put in your weight, pull down a list of fish that you eat, and based on the average amount of mercury in that fish, it will calculate how close you are to being in danger of poisoning yourself with mercury. Once we got this law passed in California, we went to Safeway right here in the Bay Area, the third largest supermarket in the world, and said, well, why are you warning people in California, but you drive right across the border into Nevada, and you're not warning the people of Nevada. So they said they would work with us to uh, get these signs up around the country. We work with them, we work with them, nothing happened. So we ran a full page ad in the New York Times. The next day they called us, said, why did you do that? We said, we're going to work with you. And we said, well, we've been working with you for a year and a half and uh, you're taking too long. The next day these signs were up around the country. And you can see the results of that. Um, during that campaign, we were greatly able to uh, reduce the amount of imports of swordfish into this country, both in California and nationwide. And the amount of swordfish being eaten by people was dr drastically reduced. So internationally, we work in treaty meetings. We work at the IUCN um, on the left. This is a few years ago, um, for sure is my colleague Randall Arouse. We've been working together for 20 years. He's now the Goldman Award winner for his work on sharks and sea turtles. Um, but we go to these meetings, we present our data, uh, we build coalitions, we collaborate, and we get things done. Uh, we've been to the UN. Again, I mentioned that with the, uh, our work around sharks and also our work around longline fishing. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, the BP oil spill, we couldn't ignore it. Again, that's where the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles are. We were working there. Actually, their populations were going up prior to the BP oil spill in 2010. Um, our methods were working. 
Um, then the BP oil spill hit. We knew that it was going to be dreadfully bad for sea turtles. Um, we actually found out that they were using shrimp nets, the picture over on the left, to skim the oil into pie, into uh, single areas and then light it on fire. Unfortunately, they were keeping the sea turtle rescuers. We had sent our staff down there to actually get out in boats, rescue the sea turtles from the oil, bring them in for uh, rehabilitation. They stopped letting us do it, so we filed a lawsuit. That was the easiest lawsuit we ever won. Uh, the impacts of of BP being blamed for lighting sea turtles on fire um, while they were alive was not some sort of publicity they wanted, and they turned it around in a few days, actually. We then turned our attention, and this is our current campaign, to the California Driftnet campaign. So many of you may know Driftnets were outlawed on the high seas by the UN uh, in the 80s, but Unbelievably, we still have a drift net fishery here in California. I call it the secret massacre that's occurring off of our coast. So this is a mile-long net, invisible net that's placed in the ocean. It's literally almost as long as the Golden Gate Bridge and would stretch from the uh, floor of the Golden Gate Bridge down to the water, 200 feet to 250 feet deep, over a mile long, catching everything in its path. I won't mention it, but we use the same techniques that we always did. I guess I will mention it. And uh, um, we've had some success. This campaign continues today, but we got 250,000 square miles of the closed, closed to longline fishing during the four months of the year when leatherback sea turtles actually swim from Indonesia, where they nest, to San Francisco to feed on jellyfish in the late summer and fall. You may have seen uh, the article in the paper a few weeks ago when a, one of these animals got caught tangled up in a crab net and died. So we have made some significant progress on reforming the California drift net fishery, but this fishery needs to go away. This is a bizarre way to catch animals. Um, the California drift net fishery catches more marine mammals and kills them than all other fisheries along the entire West Coast. It's been outlawed in Oregon, it's been outlawed in Washington, but California still has this fishery that most people don't know about. I talked to biologists and naturalists and they aren't even aware that it still is occurring. Originally it was a thresher shark fishery. They wiped out all the thresher sharks and they switched over to swordfish. So they're in the process of wiping out the swordfish now. So uh, to summarize kind of the history of our organization, at least what we've been up to in the last uh, few months, we just got hard caps for whales and dolphins on the California drift net fishery, but we're calling for a complete phase out. We're actually going to be in LA in front of the Pacific Fisheries Management Council meeting next week protesting. Um, and we got a bill introduced last year into the legislature. Unfortunately, it didn't make it out of committee. We're working to make sure that next year it definitely makes it out of committee. Um, recently, we also got American Airlines and UPS to agree to ban the shipment of shark fins. Um, we've now gotten the U.S. government to threaten Mexico under a comparability law on the imp on the killing of marine mammals on all seafood that's imported into the U.S. And we have the rules in place um, and countries have been given two years to basically get their act together. But in the event they don't, then their seafood will be restricted from coming into the U.S. and being sold here. Um, we recently got Louisiana, which had its own law, which uh, prevented uh, their law enforcement, their state law enforcement for enforcing the federal TEDS law. We got that turned around and on and on. So we're busy. We're looking for you all for help and I'll be getting to that shortly. So that was part one. Part two is to convince you that Cocos Island is one of the most incredible places on the planet. And unfortunately the quote above this photograph 
was by Jacques Cousteau, who called Cocos Island one of the most beautiful islands in the world, or the most beautiful island in the world. Cocos Island is located in the middle of the Eastern Pacific Ocean. It's 350 miles off the coast of Costa Rica. It's about halfway between uh, the Central American coast and the Galapagos Islands that you can see down uh, in the left-hand bottom corner of this slide. Cocos Island has a long history of being used by pirates and whalers, and in fact the um, the treasure of Lima is is rumored to be buried there by by pirate fishermen, and people have been looking for this treasure on this island for many many years. But as I will show you, the real treasure of Cocos Island is not on the island and it's not man-made, it's under the water. Um, Costa Rica claimed Cocos Island in 1832, took them 150 years to turn it into a national park, It became a U.S. World Heritage Site Biosphere Reserve in 1997. It was only in the last 15 years that the ocean around it was finally protected with a no fishing zone and more recently that's been expanded into what's being called the seamount management area. So why is it so fantastic? Cocos Island has some of the highest biomass of underwater species in the world. Um, that's because three different oceanic currents um, meet at Cocos Island bringing a lot of upwelling, a lot of um, biomass, and small animals attract the bigger animals, and that's what I'm about to show you. Um, high percentage of species endemism, both on land and in the water, and it's the only island in the eastern tropical Pacific that has both rainforest and cloud forest on it, with the summit at 1,900 feet and more than 200 waterfalls uh, on the island falling right off into the ocean because it gets about 21 feet a year of rain. So now I'm just going to show you some beautiful pictures of Cocos Island. Most famous for its hammerhead sharks. It's very large populations of hammerhead sharks, but also the fact that you can get up close and rather personal with these animals because they come in to be cleaned by these little yellow fish called butterfly fish. So the, the sharks are coming in for a massage and they're turning on their side and they're all relaxed and you can hide out right next to them and literally touch them. It's also famous for its very large populations of hammerhead sharks. All these photographs were taken on our uh, Cocos expeditions. Cocos Island, we're trying to make Cocos Island famous for sea turtles as well. And um, when, when I first went to Cocos Island in 2007, there was a very large population of sea turtles. You'd see them on every single scuba dive. Um, things have changed, and I'll talk about that briefly as well. But back to the photographs. Not unusual to see more than one sea turtle at a time. Sea turtles also come in to be cleaned. So this sea turtle is in its relaxed position, allowing those fish to pick the parasites off of them. Another very common shark at Cocos Island are the white tip reef sharks. And Cocos Island is famous for its famous night dives, where these reef sharks go into a feeding frenzy They've actually learned to use the lights of the divers um, to feed, and you will get hundreds and hundreds of fish feeding at once. In more recent years, tiger sharks have come to Cocos Island. We have a long record of people diving at Cocos 
tiger sharks weren't known to be there. In 2007, we saw no tiger sharks. Uh, by 2009, 2010, tiger sharks had shown up. And a report I read just this morning was that they saw tiger sharks on virtually every dive um, on this last trip. We also have whale sharks at Cocos Island. Lots of big fish. Galapagos sharks and silky sharks. And this was actually in a bait ball where dolphins had rounded up smaller fish into a ball. And then both the sharks and the dolphins were shooting through the ball uh, having dinner. An amazing experience. I've only experienced this twice in my 300 dives there. Um, but it's worth it to do it 300 times to get to see this. Rays. A uh, number of species of rays at Cocos Island. This is called the marbled ray. And uh, the diver in the background with the spear is uh, on our team. And that's what we use to tag the uh, sharks underwater with. So we have manta rays, we have devil rays or mobilas, we have uh, eagle rays, marine mammals. It's not unusual to get to uh, dive with dolphins coming over to check you out. It's always an exciting thing. We also see humpback whales there, and on one occasion I've seen an orca there. And lots and lots of fish, small fish that feed the large fish. These are called whippersnappers, blue and gold snappers, surgeon fish, and jacks, or schools of jacks larger than any schools of fish I've ever seen. To say, I don't know if it's hundreds of thousands or millions, but sometimes you see schools that stretch 60 feet. Um, vertically in the uh, water column and as far as you can see. And you can swim into the middle of these and all you see is silver. Some unusual fish as well, the Cocos batfish, an endemic fish, uh, found in relatively deep depths on the sandy bottoms. Um, that thing, that funny thing on its head is a lure, so it lures in fish and then sucks them in has these bright red ruby lips and it hops along the bottom. It's a very unusual fish. There is coral there, but sometimes the fish get in the way of being able to see it. Another unusual fish, the Commerson's frogfish. This fish also has a lure, although it has it folded in, but it wedges itself between rocks or on coral, looks like a rock itself, wiggles its little lure and then sucks in its dinner. Eels, did I mention eels? A lot of times you go scuba diving, you see a, an eel under a rock, you call all your friends over to see it. At Cocos Island, you see eels under every rock. And so after a short period of time, uh, it becomes rather common sight. But there are actually 30 different species of eels there, um, including the tiger eel, more common eels. There are some invertebrates there too. The box fish, I'm um, sorry, the box crab, really unusual looking animal. And then one of my favorite, the imperial sea urchin, which um, this photograph doesn't really do it justice, but those little white dots are actually uh, iridescent blue. Um, and it has these strange tri five triangles on them. This is looking obviously straight down on it, but if you get down to their level, it looks, no matter which way you approach these animals, it looks like it has two big eyes staring at you. And uh, the entire ocean bottom when this photograph was taken, there were thousands of these things just slowly marching along the bottom. So why are we at Cocos Island besides enjoying ourselves at at what I believe to be one of the most incredible places under the water. Um, and when I first went there, I can tell you, I felt like I was seeing the oceans 
the way they must have been two or three hundred years ago in a lot of places, but we've unfortunately wiped out most of the fish, wiped out most of the sharks, wiped out most of the sea turtles. And so I really felt like I was peering back into history and committed myself to really protecting this area. So we go there several times a year. We're trying to understand the importance of Cocos Island to the biodiversity of the entire region. We're studying the movements of these highly migratory animals, the sharks and the sea turtles. We're trying to evaluate the effectiveness of the rules inside the marine protected area at Cocos, and we seek to improve those protections with better data and better enforcement throughout the region. And we're using a number of tools, and I'm going to show you some of those in a minute. Um, but we're using acoustic telemetry to keep track of where these animals are going. Um, and the receivers for those sometimes have to be placed using submarines, which I'm going to show you in a second. We have, we're using satellite telemetry. We just started using a crowdsourcing satellite uh, technology that I'll show you in a minute. We're using UAVs. And we're also looking at the genetics of these animals to better understand where they came from and where they may be going. So now I'm going to show you a two-minute video or three-minute video of our trip in uh, last year in April. And it's working. So what we're doing here actually is deploying a acoustic receiver at 180 meters, which is deeper than you can do scuba diving. And this is part of the seamount management area I mentioned. And this is called Las Gemelas Seamount. It's about 40 miles from Cocos on its way to the Galapagos. And as you will see later on, we're trying to show the connection of the animals there um, that are moving between these two marine protected areas. So that was it. Uh, fun in a submarine at 500 feet, placing that receiver. We replaced that in April, and we'll be going back in the next few months to actually see what data that we found. We also, on that trip, started testing um, a UAV, a drone. And this is to try to better protect the area from illegal fishing. So there's a 12 nautical mile protected area around Cocos, um, but fishermen sit on the edge, and at night they sneak in with their long line gear and are harvesting sharks and turtles and other fish. And so we, again, and this came out of a, one of our expeditions where we bring people along who are interested in our work, and someone started talking to me and said, oh, I designed drones in an earlier part of my life. And we started talking about them. And before long, we had actually found a company that this year, 2016, is going to provide that drone that you just saw, $250,000 toy, and three technicians to monitor illegal fishing inside the reserve. And then we will go to court and uh, try to prosecute the people who are illegal, illegally fishing there. And again, this just came out of discussions on these trips. And um, those are the kind of discussions I'm hoping to have with you all over time to really help us protect the oceans. Um, pretty amazing technology here, though. And again, we found a company that's basically donating this for three months next year. We're going to do it in three one-month periods. We're not going to let the fishermen know when we're there and when we're not there. Um, so hopefully it will change their behavior when they know they can get caught um, for the times when we're not there. But if not, we will prosecute. So this was a fun trip. Actually, we were on a, a vessel 
called the Aleutia, owned by Ray Dalio, one of the richest men in the world. He donated the vessel to us um, to allow us to place that receiver down deep. And um, interestingly, Las Hamelas, which is now a protected seamount, we couldn't find it. So we had uh, we knew where it was supposed to be, and we got there, and it wasn't there. Uh, luckily, this vessel also had side beam sonar. They spent eight hours doing surveys before we found the top of the seamount where we could place this receiver. So it's always fun. Um, and luckily, there were people there who knew technology who could help us out. One other project we just did this year is an experiment. Uh, Digital Globe has a program called Todd, Tom Nod, and they take satellite images of the Earth all the time. They agreed to take satellite images around Cocos Island, and then they have a crowdsourcing program called Tom Nod, where they put these photographs up and people went out and looked for vessels for us. So we had thousands and thousands of photographs. They actually got 11,000 people from 140 countries to be looking at these photographs, trying to identify illegal fishing vessels. Again, this was an experiment, um, and we're still analyzing the results. Back to the technology, um, we're using a number of other technologies. One are acoustic tags and receivers. That was an acoustic receiver we were placing um, using the sub. On the left hand side in the hand there, the red uh, tag are placed either internally in the animals or we place them externally um, on a tether. And basically all this technology does is let you know whether the animals are around the receiver or not around the receiver. So it's basically all it tells us is presence or absence and which individuals that we tagged. So to make this work and to understand the movements of these animals around the eastern tropical Pacific, we're working with colleagues in all the countries around the Pacific and we now have these listening devices set up at Cocos Island, at Galapagos Island, at Mapello Island which is off the coast of Colombia, um, Coiba Island off of Panama and on and we have more and more of them going in along the coastlines now to try to understand where these animals are. Um, and as you can see on the left-hand side, we've, we've tagged hundreds of hammerhead sharks, a number of other species, whale sharks, sea turtles with this technology now. We use this technology because it's relatively inexpensive. They're, the tags cost a couple hundred dollars each as opposed to satellite telemetry that which costs a few thousand dollars for each tag. So we can have a much higher uh, sample size and we're now sh starting to show that these animals are moving between these different biodiversity hotspots. We've started using satellite technology. The price has gone down some um, and we do this in a number of different ways. On sea turtles we either glue them to their back with epoxy and uh, the turtle, this turtle is a green sea turtle or called the eastern tropical uh, black turtle and you can see why and it's got all of our uh, little technologies on it so we're still using the flipper tags on that right front flipper there um, the same technology that was being used for the last 50 years to tag turtles but we also have the satellite tag glued on its back and then over in the back of its shell you can see we place an acoustic receiver as well. So we're testing the technologies to figure out which ones work best. We've tried several different satellite technologies. We also have the one at the bottom on the left. It's tethered. We drill a little hole in the back of the shell. We tether this uh, to the turtle. It drags behind. When the turtle surfaces, the antenna pops up. It's buoyant, sends a signal to a satellite. Satellite sends it down to, our, to my computer and we can follow these animals in real time. And then a third satellite transmitter that we've also tried, different companies trying to figure out which ones work best in our conditions. To place the uh, tags internally, you have to catch them. So this was another expedition to Cocos Island where we had a special vessel. Um, this 
a large tiger shark, actually several were caught, were actually this that platform goes under the water and lifts the animal out of the water. We were able to attach a satellite transmitter to its dorsal fin. Again, satellite technology only works when you're above water. It doesn't work underwater as the acoustic tags do. So it only works for animals that surface, and the, at least the antenna has to be above the water to send the signal. Um, we also place the acoustic tags surgically inside the animal, and then those acoustic tags will last for 10 years. When we attach them externally, they usually fall off in a, in a few months. Um, we've had one last for about 150 days. Low tech, so that's me over on the left. So while all this high tech stuff's going on, I'm down there with a pencil and a little piece of plastic uh, taking notes on populations, counting turtles and sharks. We've also tried to get as many people involved as possible. So as people are there, they can take photographs of our uh, turtles. And if you, the, the uh, scales on the head are unique and you can identify individuals. Also with whale sharks, you can take a picture of the spotting pattern and then there's a technology kind of like fingerprint technology. You can run it through a computer. They can identify individuals and it allows thousands of people around the world to provide data on where these animals are moving. Um, back to the receivers underwater. Again, when people go on the expeditions with us, we need help. So there's usually my partner and I, Randall, um, but there's a lot of things to do. All these receivers have to be taken aboard, taken down, taken up above onto the vessel, download the information, change the batteries, bring them back down. Um, at the same time, we're trying to count turtles and sharks, catch turtles, tag sharks. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, and we basically use folks like you to help us get all this work done. So here's an example. Again, there, there's me. Uh, plan on this dive was to tag a shark, but a sea turtle swam by. So uh, I needed help. I needed to get rid of the, uh, the spear uh, to be able to land the shark, bring it up above, and, and put the technology on the animal. And this is tagging a whale shark. This is another one of our colleagues, Alex Hearn. Um, tagging a whale shark with an acoustic tag. The other technology we're using is we're taking um, tissue samples from these animals and looking at their genetics. And this has given us information about the importance of COCOS. We have animals coming from around the world actually to spend at least part of their lives, part of their life history at COCOS Island. So from the uh, samples that we've collected, we gave them to a graduate student and she's been running those samples and we now know that about 70 percent of the turtles at Cocos Island are coming from Galapagos. About 10 percent are coming from the major nesting beach in Mexico. Um, And then about 3% is coming from the coast of Costa Rica. But interestingly, 10% of all the animals are coming all the way from the Central and West Pacific, traveling thousands of miles to literally spend their juvenile years at Cocos. So we believe these animals somehow are getting to Cocos where they spend more than a decade before they reach sexual maturity and then they will swim back to their natal nesting beach to lay eggs. And uh, so this is part of the mystery. We're still not sure exactly which beaches they're coming from in the Indo-Pacific because um, there aren't good samples. At all these other sites, the turtles have been sampled there so we know their, their specific genetics. And just to give you a look at the uh, Satellite telemetry, most of the animals, again, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's an important uh, nursery ground for juvenile turtles. So a lot of the animals we marked stayed, place, stayed in place, but a number of them took off. Um, this one animal, uh, the, northern, the, the top of the screen went all along the Costa Rican coast, all the way to El Salvador, started heading back out to sea. 
when we lost transmission. We've had animals go to Panama, Costa Rica, Colombia, and excitingly, one of them has made it to Galapagos to prove our genetic uh, data. So the other thing that we're doing with uh, this information is looking at whether the 12 nautical mile no fishing zone is large enough for the animals. So looking at the home ranges of these animals when they do stay put at Cocos and to see if that 12 nautical mile fishing area is large enough. So this is a gives you an idea of some of the data. This animal, uh, if you catch the turtle, you get to name it. So this animal was named Emily. And as you can see, this animal pretty much stayed within the 12 nautical mile area. Interestingly, that 12 nautical miles was just made up. Um, the number was picked. I don't know how it was picked, but it wasn't based on scientific data. But for sea turtles, at least for Emily, it seems to have worked pretty well. On the other hand, some of the other turtles spent significant times outside the 12 nautical mile area. This one named Noni spent 70% of its time outside. And just to summarize that data, approximately 40% of the points um, were outside that 12 nautical mile area, suggesting that it could be larger to better protect the animals. The message, though, is no matter how big the marine protected area, if it isn't really protected, um, it's just a circle on a piece of paper. And so, again, using the drones, using radar, um, we are starting to collect the information necessary to better protect and enforce the entire region. Um, down on the left-hand side of that photograph on the bottom is a big pile of illegal longline gear that was confiscated inside the reserve. And our data helped um, to produce what's now called the seamount management area. So Cocos there in the center, um, there's a no fishing zone in the green area. So the illegal fishermen were largely coming in. So the, as I mentioned in the first slide, Cocos, uh, the coast of Costa Rica is to the north there. So the fishermen were hanging right on the border and then sneaking in at night. So we've enlarged the uh, protection area around the northern edge of Cocos Island, taking it out um, an additional three or four miles. Then there's a closed area, is the green part, uh, around La Samela Seamount. And then the yellow area, we're still working with the government to come up with the rules of what fishing will be allowed and what won't be allowed. Currently they're outlawing tuna fishing there. Getting to the end here, just another um, piece of data that's incredibly interesting. I, I mentioned that uh, sea turtles seem to have been going away and that occurred at the same time as tiger sharks showed up at Cocos. And so uh, we know that Tiger sharks eat sea turtles. We've watched them eat sea turtles. And, uh, and as the population of tiger sharks has gone up, the population of sea turtles have gone down. So part of it, they've changed their behavior. They're harder to find. Part of it is they're just being eaten. As I mentioned before, uh, we finally last year tagged a sea turtle that swam to Galapagos proving um, the connection, the migratory connection. And our data now shows that green sea turtles and leatherback sea turtles move back and forth between cocos, as well as hammerhead sharks, silky sharks, and Galapagos sharks. So the reason why we're collecting this data and what we're trying to do now is create a marine protected swimway that will connect Cocos Island National Park with Galapagos Marine Reserve, owned by two different countries. Luckily, the economic exclusive zone, the 200 miles between these, um, so governments own 200 miles from their coastline because Co uh, Costa Rica owns this little dot in the middle of the ocean. They own 200 miles from their coast and then they own 200 miles around Cocos Island, creating the dotted line, um, significant swath 
of the entire eastern tropical Pacific owned by Costa Rica and connecting to the Galapagos or the Ecuadorian EEZ economic exclusive zone. So we're now working with, with these two countries to try to create a protected area so these animals are not only protected when they're in the marine protected area but they'll be protected as they leave the area and swim between these two different uh, reserves. So that's our goal, that's what we're working on now. And the data that we have, obviously we're, we're in the process now of getting it published, that's to get the scientific data out to present the arguments for creating this marine protected area, but again we also do it in many other ways as well. We've had a number of documentaries done on our work in Costa Rica and Cocos Island and Galapagos. Uh, we publish articles in magazines and then down at the bottom the Cocos Island uh, sign there actually Sherman's Lagoon a comic strip that's syndicated in 150 newspapers. Um, I work with the artist, the, the comic strip writer uh, gave him information about the different dive sites at Cocos and he actually followed one of our satellite transmitter turtles uh, in his column for two weeks and gave people the uh, URL where they could watch the turtles in real time moving around. So, oh, one minute. So, to end sharks and turtles, their recovery, um, yes, with your help. So join us. So I, I really hope you all who are watching this will join a Cocos expedition. We have three trips next year. We want to figure out how Google can help with all their technology to better protect the oceans. We want you to brainstorm with us on and implement new technologies. I invite you to contact me directly. There's my email information. The best time to talk about this stuff, whoops. <laughs> is right on the boat after dives and uh, that's where all the good ideas happen. I want to thank Mark Merlin for inviting me here today and Jennifer, Arturo Crespo who all went on our last trip in July and I hope to meet some of you all on our next trip. Thank you again.